Let's start on, first of all, thank you so much for the kind invitation. I'm thrilled to be here. I wanted to start this conversation, uh, these 10 minutes I guess we have, just to invite you to start thinking about any product you might be using now, any product you like, and then expand the boundaries. <coughs> Try to start asking yourselves, where do the main raw materials come from? Who's the main supplier? Who might be the supplier of the supplier? Then go to the other side of the story. After you use that product, what do you think might be happening to that product? Would that be reused? Would that be reincorporated into another product? Would another bright company or NGO find out that there is something we can do to close the loop as one of the many options? That's the idea of this conversation. So I will divide that into three parts. First, I will go quickly and talk about some background, some mega trends that have shaped supply chains, so that we call them now sustainable supply chains. On a second portion, I will start talking about how some companies have reacted to that. And on the third and last portion, I will just try to open up with a question like, what can we do about it? As an NGO, as a consumer, or as a company? Let's take it from there. Oh, you gotta turn it off. So first thing, mega trends are shaping our world. I'll go quickly on this first one because all of us are aware about the context. Among some issues, first, think about population growth. Put it on context of your own lives. 40, 50 years ago, 30 years ago, probably we were just above 1 billion people on this planet. Then, when some of you finished college, that population moved from 1 up to 3 billion people. And now, as we are listening to this talk, we're more than 7 billion people. Good luck feeding all those guys. And please observe that most of that population is coming up out of developing countries, which entails another challenge that we need to face. The challenge I'm talking about is, in a way, good news, because we are saying that within the next 15 years, two and a half billion people will move from low poverty to middle class. That's great. But that also implies that the amount of energy, the amount of food, the amount of goods that we need to provide will grow exponentially. Oh, Omar, let's step back. So you're saying population is growing exponentially and a lot of people are moving from low, low income to middle income. That means a lot more resources that we need to provide. To give you a glimpse of what that would mean without putting a lot of numbers, if we just look into how much energy we will need to provide within the next 15 years, probably we might need to talk about a new China. Put that on earth again. So part of the conversation, if I start talking about, about energy, can also deviate into water or any other resource. You have seen plenty of the photos, like uh, the, the one I'm showing there, about water scarcity. But going back, think about yourselves. Think about how many of you had a beer last night, a coffee right now, how many of you are wearing clothes and anything. And for every single activity we run, yes, there is an impact. We can find ways to neutralize that or so on. But again, put all slides in context. A lot of people moving up from low to middle income, we still need to get energy, we still need to get water. We need to do something about all that. Yes, a lot of bright companies, and I was very fortunate to listen to the previous presentations this morning, have already engaged into new ventures, have already tried to find ways to cut on the amount of resources that they use and provide the same outputs. There is also business sense of that. Every time you cut on the amount of resources that you consume, you're cutting down on the bills it, themselves. So that's good news. Uh, but just for a second, let's think also beyond the environmental impacts of that. And let's also start assuming the big responsibility of understanding any social implications involved on where I would be procuring those products. That's part of the story. When we talk about sustainable supply chains, we are bringing on the table the three guys. The economic factors, the environmental impact, and the social implications of what we're doing. And the deal is that we need to find a way to get them all together and solve them as a single system. Supply chain analysis from the operations perspective is more about finding the best way to match supply and demand. Some guys have to create the demand if it's not there already. And some others will find the best means to procure for that. The problem when we put this in context, in perspective, 
is that there are tons of different players, and players may not always have the same goals in mind. Still, you need to address the three things, economic, social, and environmental. What we see that companies have done to improve or to solve some of these problems, just to give you a first idea, what they call life cycle thinking. That's exactly the question I asked at the beginning of the presentation. We said, go beyond the product you have, try to think backwards to the supplier of the supplier, and forward to the use and final disposal of that. More than that, before we talk about Patagonia here on, on, on this wonderful event, well, Patagonia has a dress straight, and you as consumers can go and check how is it that they go about finding their suppliers? How is it that they go about developing their suppliers? What would happen if one of these suppliers is messing up and is not doing the right thing? All of these are open questions, and they provide you an answer for that. All of us can start just thinking about the place where most of our products are coming from. This is just an example. By the way, I'm not endorsing any company at any point on this talk. But just as one of the many tools you might see, they try to give you a visual on where products might be coming from. And that by itself will give you guidance about what kind of programs you can start running. Another company, which is probably 50% of all, are using that directly or indirectly, Apple. They also jumped into that, that journey some years ago. And some of the benefits they can get when they start thinking broadly and they start understanding, in this example, their supply chain is where to focus their battles. Yes, there are tons of different things you can do for any product, any service. And the, the, the opportunities to improve are endless. But we need to be smart, because resources are just limited. So let's always think, where is exactly that I should place my resources to gain the highest impact? In this example, you can realize that most of what they will do is related to manufacturing, dealing with their suppliers, and the product use. That might be different for each of the products that we might be thinking of. But the deal is always the same. Find the hot spots and focus on the hot spots that could starting. This is just a list of things you can do when you go beyond and start thinking about supply chain management. Some of the main things we might be doing are related to changing on the materials that we're using. We had a presentation before on that, so I will go deeper. You can focus also on how you manufacture the products you have. You can focus on opportunities with retailers. You can focus with the way you use the product and the final use. Yes, there are tons of different things you may, you may, ha you may have a chance to do. But as an open question, if you as an NGO, as a new company, wants to start this journey and check what would be the social environmental impacts associated to my supply chain, this is just the first starting point. Go and focus on one product or one service that you believe is core. Out of that, just based on what you know, start tracing back, start contacting your main supplier. And try to there to go to the supplier of the supplier. Have a first visual. I know it's easier to say than to implement, because sooner than later you will realize a challenge that we all faced. The fact that none of us here has enough time, enough resources, enough money to come up with the best analysis you can ever think of. So never let analysis paralysis to jump into you. As soon as you can just set a, a deadline, as soon as you have information within a week, two weeks, three weeks, that might be enough to give an idea of what are the next projects you might need to start working on. You don't need to be super, uh, super analytic in order to come up with the best results. Sometimes even a checklist is enough. This is another example. By having a quick checklist, it will give you an idea of where you should be focusing your battles. That's what I'm saying, choose your battles. And the second key takeaway will be make sure you find a way to work with an NGO. There are tons of NGOs who know more, more than us and more than many other companies about the specific areas of knowledge. Get them on board. Last point here. For those who are more on the, on the private sector, keep in mind, CSR and sustainability is not only the good, it's not only the right thing to do and to adopt, but it can also have a lot of business sense if you really know how to adopt it. That's why on this slide I'm saying CSR and sustainability can literally transform a brand. I'll tell you what I'm talking about. Some of you may know this product. Again, I'm not endorsing any product, but just curious, how many of you have used Dove products before? 
For those of you who have not used it, that's the secret of my beauty. <laughs> no. Going beyond that, guys, which is a quick joke for lunchtime. This brand is not new. But some time ago, they decided to jump and start uh, uh, throwing different types of ads with people who look more alike like we are. They tried to their this misconception about beauty. Yes, they pushed forward with these kind of initiatives. And among many other results that they got, they managed to increase sales by 7%. For that kind of product, it's a lot. And more than that, they managed to help in these revolutions about trying to think about social implications of the products you have. So there are good chances to come up with good products, with good social costs, and make them business uh, attractive. Another good company you may know, Whirlpool. We don't have time to show a video here, but if you have a chance later, just go and jump into that. Whirlpool, this appliance company, they are working with other NGOs, so, such as Habitat for Humanity. Uh, you can read about hundreds of thousands, more than 100,000 new appliances that they have donated, tons of hours. You can read that kind of stories for many private companies, meaning that companies can still be profitable if they jump and they work with NGOs. NGOs, as I said before, they might provide knowledge, but very important, they might also provide some credibility. Don't get me wrong on what I'm about to say, but if you as a private company do the, the right thing, the good thing, and you come front and say, look guys, I'm so good, I'm doing all this good stuff, people on the other side of the bench will go and say, wait, so you're trying to brainwash me so that I can keep on buying your products? That might be the case for some companies, that might not be the case for some other companies. But what if we just endorse a program through an NGO? An NGO that doesn't have any economic interest, that is completely independent, that has some authority. That might increase chances. So those of you who work at NGOs, and thank you for doing that, very important. Try to find if there is business value in a partnership, on a collaboration with some of the private companies that might be outside. If I didn't say that before, make sure you partner with an NGO. So some quick takeaways on this short talk, and I will also happy, I will be happy to stay around for longer. We talked at the beginning, mega trends are shaping supply chains. There's nothing we can do against that, just understand and embrace that. Second, one good exercise will be to adopt a holistic view, to think beyond what the product we're using and try to, to understand the sources and the final destinations. Third, green designs. For many of the activities, if you'd spend some time on improving the design of a product, trust me, you will come up with long improvements, big improvements. On the second set of takeaways, I said before, choose your battles. The amount of things you can do are endless, resources are limited. Be smart about it. Never underestimate the power of NGOs. Keep that in mind, because they are a good partner to bring value to what you're doing. And CSR and sustainability can really transform a brand, and if you haven't realized, I am a firm believer of having fun and being positive on whatever we're doing. As a personal comment, I feel that some of us are already tired of hearing stories about how bad humans, humans are, how the world is collapsing and all that. That might be true, but that will be hard for the other people to engage. What if you make them have some fun, make them understand that there's still good things we can do, and get them engaged into that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.